appreciate you all being here. I mean, we just came off spring break. It's 8 o'clock at night. I just left a class at Central Michigan in Troy, so I'm going from spirit possession. Actually, slaves going and taking over people's bodies and reconciliation, so there's a weird sort of link. So forgive me. First thing I want to say is I'm not an expert on this stuff. I know some of you saw the flyer and stuff. And like, oh my god, are sex workers coming? Um, fortunately, I have not been a sex worker um, at any point in my life. Um, although it is part and parcel of my early research, especially in Togo and Ghana, West Africa. Um, what I really want to do today is I want to show you the sex worker's perspective from what I do. And that is as an academic, I read a lot. I look at a lot. So I'm going to show you some new books that are out that are intriguing for you to read. I'm going to talk about Melissa Geary Grant's sort of argument um, against feminism and against a lot of what we think is doing good in general. And the important thing is, is to invoke agency on the people themselves. It's very similar to what we've seen with quote unquote female genital mutilation, right? It's a human rights issue, we all know that. Oftentimes folks from the top come in and they you know, try to eradicate and abolish it, and the next thing you know, girls aren't getting married. Um, girls aren't having kids, girls aren't having upward mobility. So I want you to think about this with cultural relativity. The other thing, before I go through this PowerPoint, and I will show some clips and open up, if you have any questions, please save them for the end. I'll try to get through this in 25 to 30 minutes. But I wrote a few things down here before I get into the PowerPoint over the weekend that I think is important regarding semantics and meaning surrounding sex trafficking. I think anti-trafficking advocates, which we all are, can learn a lot from sex workers. Let me premise with that. But I want to talk a little bit, borrowing from Melissa Garrett Grant, also Professor Rosenthal Emeritus at U of M, Judith Butler, uh, Ruth Behar, I've had conversations with in Michigan. These are some of the foremost feminists in the world, far um, And we disagree on some of this for certain reasons, even though I think our hearts are in the same place. But what I want to talk about before I go through this PowerPoint is the dynamics of choice, circumstance, and coercion. And I think those three C words are, speaking of conflation, often conflated. There's a lot of ambiguity there. It's the difference between choice, circumstance, and coercion. And for the last year since I started teaching human trafficking, by the way, I have 60 of you in my human trafficking class. I'm only supposed to have 20, so this must be on the radar somewhere. Um, people are really intrigued by this. Uh, a shameless plug here, I think we're going to launch human trafficking as a 3,000 level permanent class in the Peace and Conflict Studies. I will process that with sociology, with history, with political science, probably with anthropology as well. So uh, be looking for that going forward if you're interested. It may be online. Um, students, it would sense to fill out more. But for the last year or so, actually going back 20 years, the first time I was in West Africa, I went out, long story short, students went back from U of M. I stayed a couple extra weeks in the village. I was really intrigued, and that's why I became an anthropologist and why I'm poor and work at five universities and have no tenure. I should have, I should have stuck with law school. Um, <laughs> but I went out to clubs, and it's just like all these beautiful women, you know, African women around. I'm just like, yeah, you know, it must be my dashiki. I'm in my 20s. I'm looking good. You know, you know I, I've never felt like that. And, after about an hour or two, I'm sitting there drinking, and I'm literally surrounded by 10 or 12 women, and my professor, an African guy, pulls me aside from the bathroom, and he says, you know these are prostitutes? And I said, what? <laughs> prostitutes don't look like that where I'm from in Flint, Michigan, at least not stereotypically, right? And these are girls that are paying for school people. And these same girls that I know 20 years later are running women's collectives and doing beautiful things. So get that stereotype, the meth-addicted, crack-addicted, you know, woman that's, you know, in, in this game called sex work. Now, when we talk about sex work, the first thing I think you need to remember is this is work. It's an important thing to understand, it's work. And I'll talk a little bit later about where it's been legalized, what the outcomes have been. There's all sorts of ideas and talk about it. But getting back to this choice and circumstance, for the last few years, I've seen different aspects of human trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation of minors, especially uh, bothersome. And I've met with a lot of actors in Africa, uh, people locally, including our city council, Carter, Pontiac, um, anti-trafficking advocates like yourselves, law enforcement officers, uh, researchers, and sex workers themselves, both in Africa and here in the Detroit area, uh, especially in Flint, where my friend's doing ongoing research on this issue. I've talked with survivors and buyers. Um, I've looked a little bit online at traces, and I've scoured the academic literature on this stuff. So I'm no expert in this, but I do know, I think, a little bit about it. Hopefully you can learn something from this talk today. Um, when you talk to survivors and buyers, and others throughout all of this, you develop a really uneasy feeling about the language that's used. Um, you all had an uneasy feeling about the fact that this is from a sex worker's perspective and here's this male guy who's never been a sex worker talking about it. So that's, that's exemplary of what I'm talking about. The concept of trafficking is employed by different groups in ways that confuse and in my opinion obfuscate different aspects of commercial sex. There's no doubt that the politics around sex work and trafficking are ugly. They're very ugly. But if we're actually going to help those who are abused and exploited we need to get beyond the course categories and try to understand this messiness. It's very important. So as I've grappled with my own conceptualization of the issues in this space, 
I've come to realize that those invested in anti-trafficking interventions, and Dana Boyd and Judith Butler would agree with this, would gain from talking a lot with and a lot more, importantly, listening to sex workers. Dudo macromo, acronym holy, they say in West Africa, God gave you two ears and one mouth, so you listen twice and talk once. Sex workers I talk to have beef and contention with feminists across the board. I want you to know that. Across the board. I've never met one empowered sex worker who's published anything that doesn't have contention with feminists, even though feminists are doing great things. This is not a rip on feminism. I'm telling you what sex. You hear the same thing in Africa about feminism, too. Black women get really disgruntled. Here are some, you know, Birmingham type white women that are coming to talk about female genital mutilation or what we need to do to have clean water. We have to be very careful with the power and talking down to folks. And we do that sometimes unconsciously. Our heart's in the wrong place, our head's in the wrong place. Um, and I've been guilty of that myself. So I would encourage you to go to the Sex Workers Project. Google it, go to it, that's where you'll hear these stories. I'm not unlike the Peace Journals, these are journals written by people from throughout the world about it. So I know it's controversial, but I want to tell you a little bit about what I've learned. Commercial sex is not a homogeneous process. Uh, when you talk with sex workers and sex positive activists, you often hear the language of choice, circumstance, and coercion. And I write those C words, those three C's now. That's important if you really care about this issue. Choice, circumstance, and coercion. And I've heard a lot of different definitions, I'm sure you have as well, but I I've sort of come to understand this language as a spectrum of sorts. On the one end, you have choice, where individuals with a high level of agency and capital, including Melissa Garrett Grant, who's written Playing the Whore, which I'll talk to you about, one of the best books, sort of poorly organized, but one of the best books I've read in the last three years from a sex worker's perspective. I would put Campadu's edited book up there as well. Um, the high-end prostitutes, quote-unquote, right? Those who are engaged in pro-sex public narratives. You know, those who don't have sex at all, they just maybe tie a guy up and tickle him or slap him up a little bit, right? All of these things um, are under the auspices of what sex work is. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the coercion. The coercion that concerns us all, where individuals lack any form of agency or capital, and they're directly or indirectly forced into the trade through manipulation or force. Manipulation, those manos en espanol, la man in French, right? It means to have a hand in things, right? To manipulate, to have a hand in things. Circumstance itself can also be treated as a spectrum. On the end, closest to choice, we have individuals who believe that they have the right to sell any part of their damn bodies that they want for financial gain. The logic is simple. Why should one's genitals be off limits when one is allowed to sell one's brains, one's hands, or one's back for labor? The bulk of circumstance has more to do with challenging economic issues, including poverty, especially structural poverty, and financial desperation, which is becoming all the more normal. Even in, we talk about Africa, oh, seven of the top ten growing you know, economies in the world are in Africa. That's true, but the gap between the rich and poor is widening there, the stratification, just like it is throughout the rest of the world. In other words, there's not enough jobs. Prince could bring, Trump could bring back all the quote-unquote jobs he thinks are from China and from Mexico and we'd still lose too many to automation, right? Those jobs are gone. So this isn't going to be a problem that goes away. This is going to be a problem, in my opinion, that's going to get worse before it gets better, unfortunately, although there is some hope. But the closest thing to coercion, there are individuals who are financially hard off uh, and they're grappling with serious mental health issues, including drug and alcohol addiction, a history of abuse, and or codependency. So many anti-trafficking advocates, including second-wave feminists, and religious individuals view all forms of commercial sex as being coercive in nature. That is not what sex workers want to hear from you. That's exclusive, right? There's only one God in the house is a prophet. You worship Jesus or you go to hell. That's exclusive, okay? Yet minds are like parachutes. They function when they're open and they really need to be open when it comes to this. Many of the religious elite condemn prostitution based on the issue of morality. Either drawing on texts that condemn prostitution or arguing that people who engage in such sinful acts must not be in the right mind. Feminists who are opposed to all forms of sex work highlight that the structural conditions of oppression, which are there, it's very true, including a long history of sexism, undeniable, racism, homophobia. Don't get me started on transgender, LGBTQ folks. I don't have time to get into that today, but that's a huge issue on itself. You could write a whole journal, you could write a whole book on that. In fact, folks are right now, including on the warrior of uh, of Southeast Asia, very interesting stuff coming out there. But the idea is, is make it impossible for low status individuals to freely choose to consent to sex for money. So the language of choice, circumstance, coercion, gets really murky. Precise, for precisely the same reasons that the feminists highlight. Plenty of oppressed individuals believe that they're engaged in sex work by choice. Okay? Most of them, in fact. Even when they're grappling with mental illness and abuse. And the history of inequality and structural oppression means that many low status individuals see few opportunities beyond commercial sex to make ends meet. There's a great book by Philippe Bourgeois written in the 1980s, Selling Crack and Charm. 
People sell crap because it's their quickest route to the American dream, because they want to eat, because they need to work. The same exact thing is here too. So with this framework of choice, circumstance, and coercion, it's primarily used to describe adult sex work. When we get into the youth, which I'm not going to do here, it does get more complicated. But I want you to understand the value of choice, the circumstance, and coercion as a model. Um, and I want to move out of the realm of direct abuse, not to undermine it, but just because of time. So I'm not saying that the practices of those who exploit adults or children who enter the life um, should be justified at all. But I think it's important to recognize that not all exploitative sex work takes the form of an abusive pimp engaged in physical oppression. Far too often, that exploitation is occurring as a result of social and structural conditions that we created as society. Sex work is not a Detroit problem or a Downer problem or a West African problem. It's a human problem. And it's a universal human problem. And it's in every society, in every sector, in every class, in every ethnicity across the world. So if we want to intervene in a meaningful way, we need to draw off these nuances and build a more complex intervention model, especially when we're talking about exploitation. Now, what do, what, do, what do sex workers see? How do they see and construct the world? I've never spoken with a radical pro-sex sex worker who is not absolutely horrified by commercial sexual exploitation. Never. I've never not talked to them. So I'm not saying that this is a good thing in any way, shape, or form. Even those who are pushing for legalization of prostitution, which I'll touch on later, are outraged uh, that people are being exploited for commercial gain. Of course. Many who identify themselves as sex workers actively work to combat trafficking. It's not like those who believe in sex work believe in rape. These are fundamentally very different things. But folks in the anti-trafficking world need to recognize how valuable sex workers can be as allies. Regardless of how any anti-trafficking group may feel about sex workers, including freetheslaves.com, who I give money to, Kevin Bales Group, another great website you should check out. One thing is clear. Sex workers often have more access to the worlds in which the majority of commercial sexual exploitation takes place. They are the anthropologists. They are evident. They are inside. Right? This access can be leveraged to find victimized youth, to help do interventions, to identify explorers, and to get the police working correctly, because that is the number one complaint for sex workers. It's not the jobs. It's not the feminists. It's the police. And I'm not going to stereotype and say, all oh, police are bad, but I'm going to tell you, the amount of reports from sex workers in the United States and in Michigan are long, are 15 times more people complaining about the police than they are the pimps and jobs. So that shit needs to get straightened away. Go ahead and put a bar of soap in and, and hope that someone runs away. And then when you run away, you got a police a policeman saying, well, you better give me a head job there, or I'm going to turn you in. It happens all the time. I've heard it from everyone from West Africa to here. This is not beating up the police. There's some police doing some great heroic things. But they need sociological training. They need peace and conflict training. They need to understand dispute resolution. They need psychology background. The same thing that our vets need for PTSD, those types of intelligent psychological things, are what a lot of these sex workers need, but they also, more importantly than anything else, need to be listened to. So as more and more organizations get involved in the anti-trafficking advocacy, like Peace Journals, like Alternatives for Girls, who are here today, thank you. I've sent many honor students in the past to you, um, wherever you are, Alternatives for Girls, thanks for showing up. But I really hope that folks will, will take a moment to listen and learn from those who identify as sex workers. Most of you, I can say, how many of you know somebody who's died of heroin overdose? You'd all raise your hands. How many of you know somebody who's been shot? How many of you know somebody who's been died in a car accident? How many of you know a sex worker? Three, four, five. So we're looking at, what, 5 to 7% of the class? But yet we're all experts, right? That, that, that's, that, that's the problem. Get, get, get to know folks. Um, I won't argue that they're helpful in getting at different aspects of the issue. But if we really need to be building large networks of allies committed to combating exploitation, we need to hear from the sex workers if we're going to make a difference in this complex problem. So, a little bit about peace journals. Let's define it, the recruitment, the harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining of a person for a purpose of commercial sex. Now, the last check, the amount of slaves in the world, according to freetheslaves.com in the United Nations, is somewhere between 20 and 23 million. Of those, about 20% are believed to be sex workers. That puts the worldwide total at 5 to 6 million. That does not include women who are not working for Johns or Pimps. That number would probably be anywhere from 15 to 100 times more than that. So even when we're talking about 6 million quote-unquote sex slaves, we're not talking about 60 million people who are quasi or what I would call peri slaves. They're not getting full pay for it uh, as a whole. So that's another part of it that needs to happen. But we all know the places, the brothels, the massage parlors, the tea houses, the strip clubs, the cantinas, including some in South Detroit, one that was busted last week, the truck stops, including one that was busted right in Toledo, Ohio, two weeks ago. 
So quick statistics, I don't know if you can read all of this, um, but the National Human Trafficking Hotline, which I have some issues with, does give some good numbers, as does the, uh, labor, the International Labor Organization. They put the number at 4.5 million trapped in sexual exploitation. Um, most accurate is including FreeTheSlaves.com, most of are, are putting it at around 6.5 million. It's $40 million in Denver a year, in, Col or in Colorado it's a $300 million a year enterprise in Atlanta. Detroit is somewhere in between there. It is a huge colossal issue, and yes, it is in Royal Oak, and even in places like Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham, contrary to popular opinion. I'm an anthropologist. I want to invoke some comparative things as well. Um, in South Asia, it takes on a new sort of cultural side. Um, I would recommend you guys look at the brothels of Kanatipura. I'm going to spend a lot of time recommending books and things like that for you just because I think that's my place here. Um, Kolkata and uh, Shibiraspur, Varanasi, very huge colossal problem in India, also in China, although it's underestimated. Um, the Devadasi system of prostitution is optional. I would encourage all of you to see this film, Born into Brothels. It's one of the better ones I've seen in Southeast Asia. And you can see a whole bunch of other things written there. These are just different case studies from Central Asia, from Southeast Asia as a whole. In Africa and the Middle East, um, it tends to be maids and nannies, domestic, uh, and also domestic servants, um, including a huge percentage in our, the wonderful country of Dubai, which I don't want to get started on, but there's a great book uh, that just came out about that. Um, um, by Priscilla Johnson from Emory University. It should be out sometime in the next couple months. If you're interested in that, send me an email and I'll send you the link on that. It's been used uh, in juju oaths, figuring out if you're capable of witchcraft, what they call Aze among the Yoruba in Africa. And trafficking in the Middle East goes back at least 4,000 years. In Dubai, it's capitalism on steroids, right? Camel jockeys, sex for sale, domestic labor. These are some of the advertisements you actually see on some of these sex ads online. Uh, the Natashas is what they're called in Eastern Europe. Um, that would include uh, Russia and former Soviet bloc countries. And a great film, which I'll show a clip of later, is called The Price of Sex um, in about, about sex trafficking in Eastern Europe. And we all know about Russian mail order brides. In the United States, the best film I've seen is called Die Hard, Survivors of Slavery in America. I'll show you some clips of that toward the end as well. Um, international sex trafficking networks operated in the United States are colossal. Craigslist, Backpage, the internet, we all know about this type of stuff as a whole. We're spending $6.2 million a year annually in the United States. If you were to average out our budget across, including putting 57% toward the military for a day with each amount of money being a day of the year, the amount of that $6 million is about 30 seconds of our tax dollars in a 365-day year. So on the one hand, we're saying, oh, wow, we're up to $6.2 million. That's to eradicate and abolish and deal with uh, uh, sex trafficking across the board. And most of that money is sucked up by police uh, departments as well. Very little of that goes to social services. We need to get outside of the box. We need rich folks like the Gates who are giving microfinance loans to start giving microfinance loans between $500 and $1,000 to sex workers. We need women's co-ops like what's going on in Northern Ghana where women take and pool their money, start their own cooperatives, and then go into other industries. Kind of like the mafia used to do with dope, right? These are the types of things outside of the box that I think needs to happen in order to get rid of this. This book is problematic. To some, it's one of the most well-written accounts from a sex worker I've read in the last five years. In fact, it might be the best. You can buy that book. I ordered it to the library here at Wayne State. You can gather that book up in only a few hours. Um, and she talks about how all these red lights districts seduce vulnerable young women into a life of degradation. The New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof live tweeting of the Cambodian brothel raid, which you might have seen. Um, on their website over the last couple years. The current trend for writing about and describing actual experience of sex workers fuels a culture obsessed with the behavior of sex workers. Rarely did these fearful dispatches come from sex workers themselves, and they never seem to deviate from the position that sex workers must be rescued from their, their condition and the industry is simply abolished. A positive comment among both feminists and conservatives and religious folks alike. Okay, the problem in my opinion, with looking at, at this, it's not just that the sex workers are brought to the table and to be talked to, but the entire problem as it is on an international and local level becomes mystified. Mystification being the process of explaining away what might otherwise be evident. And the slave in the brain, and the closed mouths, right? And all these emotional appeals. And it reminds me of like homeless folks, right? It's never, oh, this homeless person used to be a poet, or he or she started this urban garden. It's, oh, this poor person. And when do they air it? They air it around Christmas time, right? And where do they put it in the newspaper? They put it right on the front page. And it's as if these homeless people, or these drug addicts, or these folks who, you know, gave their life for our country or are on the streets, as if they have no agency of their own. And that's the same thing that has happened really exponentially, in my opinion, with 
uh, sex workers who I hear I'm calling subalterns, and we need to hear about agency from below. So here's how Melissa Gary Grant writes out her book. Those are the ten chapters. Number one, the police. That's where she starts with the police. Then she gets into the prostitute. Then she moves into the work, the debate, the industry, the people, which is, use your imagination. The stigma, the other women, the saviors, and the movement. Now the good news is, is we have places really across the world uh, where sex workers and unions have united. Denmark, for example. Sweden. Um, it's, prostitution's been legal in Senegal, West Africa, since the 1960s. Now you would think, okay, it's legal. Are they doing better? Not necessarily. What happens is, is when it's legalized, is the police don't make any impact at all. They don't go to the brothels at all. They don't look at it at all. It's kind of like what they're doing with the marijuana dispensaries here. It's a very similar sort of thing. If you pay attention, history repeats itself as a whole. But when they, when they are provided a safe haven, when they are provided social services and the chance of upward mobility, legalization has worked, not just in small case studies, but on national levels. Although, if we look at Victoria and Australia, not very successful. If we look at Germany, some say it's been very successful, some say no. Denmark as a whole, Sweden tends to get props and people tend to like uh, what they're doing. It's a rally in DC from 2015. This is another one that really gets into personhood and sex worker union organizing. A great book by Gregor Hall. Did his research here, met with a uh, representative and random sample of over 120 different women um, from throughout the United States and Europe. Uh, this is a book that's just come out recently as well. As an anthropologist, I think we need more ethnography. Ethnography is participant observation, spending time with them, not from above, not doing what I'm doing, telling you all these books and looking at all these films, but going and sitting with these folks, going to see what they, going to see what happens when they turn a trick, what risks are going on, where do you go for when you're when you're when you're done, what happens on days where you can't find, when you can't turn a trick or you can't eat, who do you rely on, who protects you when things get violent, what what were your real aspirations in life? If you were to tell me your story as a book, what would be the title of the book? What would be the title of chapter one? Okay, now that you've told me your story as a life is a book, tell me your life story as a mural. What would be the different things you would paint in the mural? Why? We have to get inside and understand these folks from the inside. That's what anthropologists are supposed to be good at doing. And most of your quote unquote experts, including myself, and I'm not an expert on this thing, have never spent a day or a night with a quote unquote expert. But yet, they're the ones writing the books and holding these things and telling you what needs to be done. That's a serious problem. The global dimensions of human trafficking, time and space have been compressed exponentially in modernity. I can go to my voodoo village in West Africa and be there in about 24 hours. I can pick up my cell phone and text the voodoo priest that doesn't even have electricity and get a text back. So time, things, time and space have been compressed exponentially. Things happen a lot faster. So that's had an effect on sex trafficking and sex work specifically. Another film that you should all take a look at, and I'll show you some clips are, is Not My Life. And that really, Not My Life in Human Trafficking defines it, it gives a prevalence of it, and it talks about gender and trafficking and slavery. And if I was to do another talk, one that I'm working on, maybe I'll put it in your peace journal, one would be on peace and flood water crisis where I'm from. The other article I would do is something on gender, conflict, and peace, um, specifically looking at gender as an analytical uh, framework for conflict-based violence. Because when women are in power in Africa, violence goes down across the board. You have, we have 19% senators in this country, but we're going to go talk about the world in Saudi Arabia, women can't drive. You know what it is in Ghana where I do my research? 65% of the Congress is women. Uganda, 57%. Rwanda, where that genocide went on, 73%. So get outside of the box. Labels are for soup cans. You would be amazed at where women are in power. Don't get me started on Arabic women in the domestic sphere because that's a whole other thing. But we don't understand. We look at people as subjugated. We look at people as oppressed. We look at the gemini and our hearts are in the right place, but we don't take the time to understand folks' agency from the bottom up. And that's a huge problem. Another great film is the introduction of gender and trafficking um, called uh, The Day My God Died. I don't know if anyone has seen that. That's a tearjerker. That's a good one. I'll show you clips of that. To Live in a Free World, this is a great book coming out of Africa. This is uh, Chiadana. Um, this is about sex worker activism in Africa, and it goes across 11, 12, 13 different countries. It shows how the women are working in co-ops. It shows how the women are unionized, how they come together to share money. Somebody dies, they don't have money for a funeral, they do it. A lot of these old things that agencies and associations used to do in the United States. And remember, folks, all of our agencies are down. When you read Putnam's Bowling Alone, parent-teacher conference, down. Sororities, down. Fraternities, down. Bowling leagues, down. Right? Hunting clubs down, book clubs down, everything down. The only thing up is social media. So we have to use, and, and, and Sarah, I'm glad that you're thinking that we have to utilize this as a tool because our associations that used to hold us up when the government failed us are dying, not just in the United States, but around the world. No one's going to church in Europe anymore. Okay? Associations, and this is what Toko said made America exceptional, so I, I think that it has its place here. 
This is a good book. Uh, it brought tears to my eyes. Next to market women, uh, prostitution, quote unquote prostitution is the number two profession for women throughout Sub-Saharan Black Africa, in which we have 850 million people. Of those 850 million people, about 460 million are women. That puts the number of prostitutes, not sex workers, it's somewhere probably around 100 million. Think about that. 100 million, a third of the population of this country. There are solutions for the future when we look at gender. This is a great case study I found from Ocho Rios. Uh, actually, Johnny Cash, before he died, put some money for me. It's interesting. He didn't want anyone to know that. I found out from somebody who was on the board. But the American Federations of Teachers, imagine that. Imagine their teachers working on sex trafficking, not teaching students about it, but actually advocating and giving these sex workers a place to stay and turning the people in to jail and giving them a chance to eat, giving them a chance at education, almost adopting sex workers. That's the Jamaican system. That's also what's starting to happen in Ghana. We haven't seen too much of that in the U.S., although our faith-based institutions, uh, especially churches, but even some mosques, even some ones locally here in Dearborn are starting to tackle this issue. That's a promising thing. Um, reasons for decriminalization, I don't have time to get into a lot of it, but if there are five valid reasons, I could give you five reasons for not for, for poor criminalization, you know, it is a balanced thing. But criminalization buyers does not protect sex workers. It's the first thing sex workers say when you put a John in jail or somebody who's helping them, it doesn't help them at all. It makes them go days without eating and not know what to do. Okay. Whatever you think of that, I'm telling you what the sex workers are saying. And they're saying this across the board. I was 80 to 90 percent would say that. Full decriminalization reduces the risk that sex, work, sex workers will be vulnerable to discrimination, eviction, or arrest. A lot of times folks are getting evicted right from their apartments, even here in Detroit, if they have people coming in and out and up at all hours of the, of the night. We actually have discrimination against these women. Decriminalization of sex work still means trafficking and other abuses are illegal. That's the thing. Just because you decriminalize and legalize prostitution doesn't mean you can beat or rape a woman. Those laws stand. Those are universal human rights. People think, oh, if it's decriminalized, now all of a sudden you can just have a full run on and do what you want with women um, and continue to invoke power on them. And by the way, the place in the world where this is going on more than anywhere is in Central Africa right now. And it's tied to war. It's also where all your freaking metal, all your things on our laptops, all our metals and shit, all this conflict, that's tied. Congo probably, since I started talking, there's probably been 200 women raped in Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo. We're talking about thousands of women a day being raped. I want you to think about that. And if that fucking problem was happening in the middle of Europe, you bet your ass somebody would be doing something about it. But it's the same damn thing with Rwanda with genocide. It took a million people to die. The Congo River, the widest river in the world, was flowing red for 48 hours. And Clinton says, oh, I fucked up. <laughs> Meanwhile, 1,500 people, folks, and it was bad. If you remember what happened uh, in the Baltics during the 1990s, it was, it was a pretty bad thing. 1,500 people died, you know? So there is race and class tied to this stuff. But don't think for one moment that there's not. One in three runaway children are lured into prostitution within 48 hours. How does that happen? Most of us have never even been a sex worker, but yet within 48 hours, these slime balls can recruit and find a woman. That, that's, that's something that needs to be thought about deeper. How does that happen? The average age of entry into prostitution is 12 to 14 years old, and Africa can be as young as 11. The highest fertility rates in the world are in Niger and Mali. 8.1 children per woman by the age of 30. Think about that. That's the highest in the world. A quarter of a million American children are estimated to be at risk of sexual, uh, child sexual exploitation. I think that number is double that. 1.2 million children are trafficked each year globally. Children, I guarantee that number is double that. 800,000 people are trafficked across international borders. That's just what we know from reporting alone. We have victims, we have sex trafficking, we have buyers, we have traffickers, and I added the police into that as well. Victims tend to be history of past sexual abuse, depending on, I don't see many random samples, but the reliability and validity on that is somewhere at around 69 to 75% report being abused by people within their own family as children. Nearly all of them, when we give psychological tests, when I say we, I'm talking about researchers, uh, mostly psychologists, but not all psychologists, find low self-esteem in four out of five women. Runaways and throwaways, obviously, is a problem. Traffickers, remember the hand, most manos, the masters of manipulation, oftentimes they know the victims. They view the victim as commodity. Sometimes you start out working, doing something else for a couple months, and within two or three months, you're turning these 10 to 12 tricks. Now, even though I'm trying to argue from the sex worker's perspective and argue a little bit for legalization, these guys, these quote unquote Johns, are obviously a problem. They come from all backgrounds and demographic, ages, races, and classes. There's many of them here in Detroit. A lot of them have gotten out of the drug game, a lot of them have gotten out of the weapon game, they're in the straight human trafficking game. Because when you sell dope, you sell dope and you get your money, right? When you have a woman, she goes and turns a trick, and she comes back and turns another one. It's a renewable resource. So think about that. 
and we know about commodities, and we know about why black. Black folks are the only folks in this country who didn't come here by choice. Most of you, if you're not African American or Native American, you came here by choice. They were brought here. So that same sort of slavery, when we look at chattel slavery or the nuances of slavery historically, we have to look at modern slavery the same way. The sick and twisted thing is, is we have more slaves in the world today than we did at the peak of the African diaspora. And more than a quarter of those are sex slaves. So major contributors worldwide, um, we can argue about media, we can argue about porno addiction, right? I mean, honestly, folks, it's, this is a relatively new thing. Human trafficking and sex trafficking is not new. It's, you read about the Old Testament, you read about the Quran, you see references to it in the Vedas from Hinduism. This is nothing new under the sun. Just the exponentiality of it is new. Often victims can be charged with prostitution even though they're trafficking victims. That happens all the time. The police force is criminalizing and hurting most of these sex workers. I'm telling you what the sex workers say when you read Melissa Garrett Grant's book and you read the people she's talking to in the case studies. All of them with the police is the number one problem. Not the jobs, not the bad economy, not structural poverty, not feminists, not anthropologists studying it, not students who navigate who give a damn to the police. That has to be tackled. And we have other problems with our police well. I'm not beating up the police. Just telling you what the women say. There's a lot of good police doing some good things. There's more good police doing good things than bad things. But as a whole, sex workers do not have to think very fondly of the police, not just here in Detroit, not just in San Francisco, but across the world. And they're worse in West Africa where I do my research. I can tell you horror stories of gang rapes happening on a weekly basis to sex workers and women. Sex trafficking is a first degree felony. Under the age of four years old, it's a second degree felony. 14 to 18 years old, it's a third degree felony. It's interesting how this stuff sort of works, right? Continuous sexual abuse of a young child or a child uh, of a child is first degree felony. Most sex workers uh, are reluctant to self-identify as victims. We know that women who get abused even as not sex workers. We know that one in two women in this country and in this world have been raped. We know that only about one in ten talk about it. So imagine how much of this is what we like to say, the encyclopedic, the unsaid, right? For many years, this is what, uh, they, this is the only way they know how to survive. Victims frequently run back to their traffickers, right, when they're released from jail. It's like recidivism, it's like people get out of prison, they go back and they sell dope, go to prison, they get out, they go back and they sell dope. Same sort of thing here. Brainwashing is a big part of it. Not to trust law enforcement is the huge, is the, is the most colossal issue here. It is the elephant in the room. And also not to trust service providers has been a huge issue. And there's enormous uh, loyalty to the trafficker and pimp, especially when drugs are involved in it. But the trauma bonds people. Unfortunately, trauma bonds people. I don't have a lot of time to get into the Stockholms or the rule of anthropology. So what can you do? Obviously, you can call this hotline. You need to contact your elected officials. Both Stavanaugh and Levin have been great as senators on this. They've been leaders on this, so our senators don't really need a letter. Um, Republicans and Democrats alike have been on this. I mean, to see Rand Paul and John McCain uh, working with Schiff and Nancy Pelosi is a very rare thing, but there is a common bond there, and that should give us hope. Um, don't contribute to the demand. And when I say that, don't go by sex with a minor, quick, with the whole, quick, look at it for him. So, I mean, you have freedom to do whatever you want. I can tell you what to do, but I can assure you uh, it creates these cultures that disempower women more. Be knowledgeable. Read some of these books that I've recommended to you. Look at some of these films uh, that I've also recommended. Some additional ideas, I think, corporate hires and corporate incubators. We need to see people like Dan Gilbert set up building a queue line, uh, putting up a few million dollars aside for sex workers locally. We need to put pressure on rich folks, village, our local ones, but all across the country. They put their money into other things, $25 million business school, right? The other thing is, is a lot of rich folks have daughters who have been sexually trapped. This doesn't discriminate on the basis of income all the time. There's a lot of upper middle class people in this country who have been victims of sex trafficking. The other thing we need to see is women's skills. Women should be leading the debate on this, not men. I feel very similar uh, about abortion. That's just my personal opinion. Um, I think when women get involved in this, like they have that. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some madams in Africa who are some cruel, mean bitches. Let me tell you that straight up, who, who, who oppress women and make money off them. I'm not saying that just because the women are in control that, this, that there's not going to be exploitation. But as a whole, women in charge of this, um, it, it, it tends to bode better for sex workers across the board. Wayne State universities talk so much. We're, having, we're holding all these talks. We're having all these people in here. I've never heard one scholarship given to a sex victim. Not here, not at University of Michigan, not at Harvard. Actually, Harvard, I think, gave one away two years ago. But this is the type of stuff that needs to happen. Because when you see folks who are sex workers have upward mobility and become successful, it sets a precedent. The other thing is, is we need uh, targeted focus on homeless folks and also the LGBTQ. We have more assaults on LGBTQ 
last year than any year in history. And not just in the United States, it's happening all across the globe. So those are a few of the things you can do. The other thing you should do is check out freetheslaves.com or freetheslaves.net. It's a wonderful website. Not for Sale campaign is doing great things. And slavery and trafficking out of um, the U.S. Institute of Peace is doing good things now. The United Nations uh, with women and gender and security are doing great things. The World Peace Foundation, Jewish Voices for Peace here locally are working on it. Um, Peace Action in Michigan are working on it. Our Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, where I'm from, are working on it. There's a talk by the City Council next week. There was a talk by the Pontiac Governor last week. There's a talk tomorrow in Gross Point. This stuff is out there. That's good. The fact that we're getting out and talking is good. But if we don't hear from the sex workers, or if we don't at least have somebody talk on their behalf about what it is they believe, I don't see us making much headway anytime soon. The other thing is, is solutions are contextual. Non-governmental organizations are involved in this. There's some ones like Tostin working on female genital mutilation in Senegal and also working on sex trafficking. They're doing great things. Their whole board is black and Senegalese people. That's the key. You don't need a bunch of people serving on boards from Utah and Detroit, you know, looking down on folks. And, 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 and not just people in Africa, people of color, but people in general. Um, so put your money, put your money into good NGOs. NGOs who have low administrative costs, NGOs who have testimonials and people talking about how much of a difference it's made in their lives. And if you email me, I can help you with some local groups, especially some local churches and faith-based groups that in my opinion are doing a wonderful thing. Um, how to make anti-trafficking movement more effective, faith-based approaches, the role of the media is very important. We need counter-narratives. We get the narratives of the you know, poor, you know, oppressed woman being beaten and having her agency stolen from her. What we don't have is the women saying, that's what we need. We need to hear from the women who have beat this stuff. We need to hear success stories. We need to have counter narratives. And a great reading is The Girl Next Door um, uh, by Peter Swindell. I would encourage you to look at the Swedish model of decriminalization. There has been a few issues with it, depending on who you ask, but I think it's more, uh, a pretty damn good template. Um, for in the amount of money that sex workers in Sweden are making is an average of around 75 grand a year. That includes health care, national daycare. You can not drop your baby off. Imagine that before you go to work and not have to pay anything. They go to a daycare center where they get good nutrition, but that's for socialist security. That's not happening anytime soon. The Netherlands has had a few more issues uh, with prostitution. Some people think it's been really good. The police do not think it's been good. The sex workers themselves tend to be pretty content, so it depends on who you ask. You should also look at the United States Trafficking Victims Act. The U.S. has really led the way, not just in fundraising, but in other things. And another article I stumbled across this summer was um, Misery and Myopia, Understanding the Failure of the U.S. Efforts to Stop Human Trafficking. And I'll have Peace Journals put this on their website when they're done, and if you want to go ahead and look at any of these slides or pick from any of this, uh, feel free to. So I'm going to show you a, a few different trailers, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, some of the films you already know about, Blood Diamond, has a little bit of that. I mean, it's not exactly sex trafficking, but there's elements of it in there. Taken, a pretty cheesy movie, but uh, nonetheless, you get the point. So the fact that this is being done, not just in Hollywood, and also now Bollywood, and also now Nollywood, which is Nigerian films, are starting to put out films from the sex workers' perspective. This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Trade is a good movie I like. Dirty, pretty things I have not seen. Um, Inhale I have not seen. And The Whistleblower um, is something that everyone, in my opinion, should see. So I invited my patient, Dr. Garen Montel, who some of you might know here at Wayne State. He's been in the anthropology department for 40 years, and I invited him uh, to come, and he had a class tonight. And this is what he wrote to me in it. And, and by the way, Haiti has some of the highest percentage of sex slaves in the world. Average male is living to be 49 years old in Haiti, the lowest in the entire world. Average annual income is about $3.75. That's post-earthquake, uh, so it's gone up. Um, Cuba has a very high percentage of prostitutes as well, although they have a very low percentage of AIDS, so it's prostitutes quote-unquote prostitutes have done better there, but here's what he said. And it kind of broke my heart, but it made me think. Homo homini lupus. With the political and moral earthquake in the Western world, which has a tradition of slavery and dependency, indeed, we're not the richest country in the world for no reason. 400 years of slavery and killing 25 million Native Americans didn't hurt either. But there is not very much ethics which still stands up, writes Dr. Monolus. The slaves, that is in his opinion, the proletariat, need to vote everywhere to keep on, they continue to vote everywhere to keep on their chains for empty promises. Sl sexual slavery shows how low humans can go. Homo homini lupus says of that. Human, lupus is the word for wolf. Human beings are wolves, especially males. Not all of us, but most of us. And that's another thing I want to say. Just like when you see somebody being sexist or racist or picking on somebody because their gender, we have to, because it's becoming normalized in today's era, we owe it to ourselves to call that out. Not just quietly, like, hey, you shouldn't say an N-word, but this dude's dropping the N-word over here. Can you believe this? Let everyone know. Same thing when it comes to this right here. Men, 
It is our, we, it is so, you might not be watching pornography, you might not have ever paid to go to a, a strip club in your life, you might have never paid for sex in your life, but you know people who do. And you need to let them know just what slime walls they are. You don't have to necessarily tell their parents, although you can threaten that. But, but as a whole, I really think that we have to take active agency in that. Here's some of my references uh, if you want to look at uh, some of this stuff as well. This is my shameless plug for my book that's out. It's on Hulu. It's not on trafficking. Um, yeah, let's look at some. <laughs>
thing, you know, these poor oppressed women that are just being beaten and battered that have no agency and no say in these horny ass men who are creating it all around the world. This is really not that simple. Especially when you when you listen to the sex workers. Now, five, ten years ago, you couldn't find a sex worker's perspective outside of Europe. Now there's books being written from UCAL Berkeley and Harvard Press. That's a good thing. And read Grant's book. If you do nothing else, read Grant's book. And you might disagree. I actually think it's sort of poorly organized. Um, but I, I also think it's just, uh, it changed the whole way I look at this stuff. Other, there's another question here. Yes? I was just going to you that. When you said that it, you know, things can be proven in a way, uh, New Zealand has yes. um, had sex decriminalized, which is different than legalization. Legalization means that the government has That's a short right. of hand in regulating things. Maybe there's a registry, people are required to get health checks. That's Federalization right. means that there's just nothing on the books about it. You can do what you want. Um, New Zealand, uh, the numbers just came back, and I don't know exactly, but it's looking pretty good for them in terms yeah. of you know, um, violence and trafficking being down. Um, and I think a lot of times these stories get um, kind of put back to back to like, oh, either you are a slave and you don't make very much money, you know, show you make ends meet, or you get paid, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, when I think a, most sex workers fall somewhere in between. Absolutely. Um, and the New Zealand case study is a beautiful example because they borrowed from the Swedish thing, but the one thing New Zealand did, the rest of the world does not, is the amount of tax dollars that are flowing for sex trafficking are going to social services and education and women, not to the police. That's what needs to happen. And again, I'm not beating up police. We need police. We need security. These folks need to be safe. We need to put money into it. But most of that money flowing toward police departments, not just in the U.S., but across the world, is not helping these sex workers at all. But you bring up a great point, and there's a big difference between decriminalizing and full blown legalization. Again, we get into these semantics just like I'm getting into. And I, I don't know a ton about New Zealand, but there's been a lot written about it uh, recently. Um, and the other thing, culturally, with New Zealand is the Maori people who have long been sort of subjugated, um, you know, kind of like African Americans or Latinos in our country, really. Um, they found a lot of gold and also agriculture, so they found new things. So you don't see the folks, quote unquote, folks of color migrating to it, so you've seen an ex economics have an effect on that too. That might be another reason why the numbers are down. But the other reason that the real numbers are down is because they are not, um, they're not busting people. So when you don't bust anyone, you say, wow, there's less sex workers. No, you're just patrolling it less. And the reason they're patrolling it less is because they're putting the money into the people who want out. And, and, and they're doing really interesting things in New Zealand. Uh, former sex workers, you can go to college for free. Not all of them, but you can apply for an application process. These are the outside of the box types of things that need to happen. The kid has a chance, the girl has a chance to go to school in a little bit of a stipend to live on. She's not going to be doing that. Unless. That's not necessarily true. <laughs> unless she's poor. Well, well, well it, again, it's choice. There's, there's levels of choice, you know. Um, not everyone is coerced. But yeah, Melissa Gira Grant says she's. she's some sex workers will tell you they like sex, period. They've had a few bad things happen to them. It wouldn't matter if they had a chance to go to college. They don't want to go to college. They wouldn't take money. And you see some people coming from six income family, millionaire families that are continuing to do it. So you're right. There's, I, mean, there's there, I mean, there are lots of Absolutely. people who pay for college for sex workers. And then they get called sick, labeled as sex addicts and even worse for us. Those are the worst type of workers. But, you know, I'm being facetious here, right? But the way they get labeled uh, is that. So the more empowered you become as a sex worker, the more before you are as a that time. Um, at least the way the world sees it, which is probably it. But yeah, you bring up a great point. And understanding the difference between uh, between legalization and decriminalization. Um, sometimes they do both. Um, other times it's one or the other. Other questions? Comments? Yes, Gigi. Um, so this is like a fairly new thing that I've been looking into, like even in my woman, gender, sexuality class and stuff. I we're discussing as well. And then this just you know, adds more to it. And I'm still trying to like, uh, really understand it. So I, I I appreciate this talk. It was a great talk. So thank you again. Um, so concerning the three C's, uh, mostly choice. Where okay, uh, some women don't have a choice, and some do. Yes. Um, when it comes to like a, a possible solution, or one of the solutions would be through education. Uh, they get education. They are aware of like other means, you know, to teach someone how to fish rather than interesting fish. Sure. Um, what about in the situations where it's true, although I would tell you.
tell you in West Africa, in my own research, those girls that are prostitutes are using that money to pay to go to school. So they're, at, so they're actually, you're saying education can answer, but they're actually using prostitution in order to get that education. Right. So it's, it, it, it's an interesting thing. Even if there's not enough jobs, capitalism is a failure. Anywhere it goes, there's going to be a, a certain amount of people who are unemployed, period. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. We created more wealth here. I mean, everyone had a house up north. Everyone had two cars. You know, you know what this guy, you know, Fordism did here. I'm not dissing it. But even in its heyday, people were standing up for, for red lines. There's always going to be a certain amount of people who are unemployed. There's always going to be a certain amount of people who are poor. And these are the people who are more high at risk for this as a whole. Um, that being said, I do think when women find a passion outside of the sex industry, if, 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 if that is indeed, if, if it is through, through there because of coercion and not by choice, um, obviously that works. And the model that really is working in South Africa is a train the trainer model, which is finding women who are empowered who are former sex workers who are now business owners, they're hiring other sex workers, and that tends to keep them out. And that's what I mean about the private sector, not just government, but private sector people caring about, about, about it. That's happened with the rape group, rap group across this country. You might have somebody knocking on your door to raise awareness for, for a rape crisis. That was a lady who was, uh, a girl who was raped in Boulder in the 1990s. He's a multi-millionaire. He gave away $170 million. And that's why they're knocking on your door to raise more money for a rape crisis. So, I mean, I mean, that's a part of it. The train the trainer model works. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think you need a lot of options for that as well, you know. In Africa, the women become market women. That's what they do most of the time. But you can make two and a half dollars a day being a market woman when you sleep with a man in Ghana or West Africa. It's a deep meal. That's a twenty dollar bill. Sometimes they can do that three or four times in the night. That's you're talking about making an average yearly income in a week. And the sick thing is, is they give that money to their parents. You know, to, to other things as a whole. So it's a very different situation, at least in West Africa, than what I'm seeing. And that's why I try to show different ones from around the world. Um, but yes, obviously, finding other choices outside of that work and giving people the confidence that they have skills and they have the capacity to do other things that make this world a better place. Good. The other thing I want to say is prostitution is the oldest, it's the oldest profession in the world. Um, Castro puts people, you know, he quarantined folks, you know, who had, because of it, they had AIDS, HIV in Cuba, but they have the lowest AIDS rate in the world. So even when people do undemocratic, crazy things, sometimes it has positive effects. I'm not saying we should be more like Cuba. I'm saying you're better off as a sex worker in Cuba than you are in the United States. You're also better off as a poor person in Cuba than in the United States, but that's a story for another day. And communism has its failures. It is probably some sex trafficking. Trust me, Russia's a hotbed. Yes? Oh, okay. Um, so I have a Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think if that is done, that that could raise a higher rates of child trafficking? Because that would still be illegal, but then things could use, like, continue wars and children because they'd still be profiting off of that. That's definitely something that's coming out of uh, the feminists and the religious. They're on comment on that. That's something that's been brought up. Um, I don't know. I can't answer that question, but it seems to me like there, there could be some sort of correlation there, yes. They, yes, And that's dangerous and that's scary. That's why it's not as simple as decriminalize or legalize. It's not enough. You have to decriminalize and legalize and educate and also off, off, offer social services and the people engaged in the industry at some point have to invest into another industry and mass scale. If that doesn't happen, then, it'll, it, then it won't get better. And, and not everyone's willing to do that because the level of coercion and choice and really, the other C that I didn't talk about is context. Some folks do it just to get by for a while, and they do get out of it. Um, and then the, and the other elephant in the room that I haven't really spoke about is the advent of drug addiction. You know, we, we know what was going on with opioids here. We know about our crystal meth problem in the South. Crack's sort of gone down, but almost everything else has gone up. The third world is getting these now, too. I see crack in villages in West Africa now. Um, and that doesn't tend to bode well for poor people as well. And heroin, everywhere. You can get heroin in my village, right outside of my village in a port, packs about the size of this cell phone for about 20 bucks, 100% of your heroin. You can get cocaine that would be an eight ball of cocaine, and I don't even know what it is here, three or four hundred dollars for about 10 or 15 bucks in West Africa. And in all, of, all the cocaine from Colombia comes through West Africa, there's no policing. All the heroin from Afghanistan comes through, so now you've got four people making two or three dollars a day hooked on drugs. Guess what's going to happen with human trafficking? It goes through the roof. The one thing about West Africa, I'll say, is you don't see the Johnson and Pence running things. It tends to be independent women and now women collectives. So I'm wondering if that is some sort of template that could be used elsewhere. You're also seeing that template in New Zealand, which you spoke about as well. Very interesting. 
Yes, Christiane. What type of outside box thinking would you suggest for the Detroit area? Ooh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He said he might come, he's a good friend of mine. What I'd like to see Detroit do, and what I think I need, me personally through the Peace and Conflict Studies, I'm ready to write a State Department grant to reach out my, and come up with my own ideas. I think the one thing that the Detroit area really could do um, is we need an immigration officer and an immigration plan. What I mean by that is white folks have had a long, hard time living in Detroit for a long time, Latinos don't, folks of color in general don't have a hard time. Latino Family Services access um, in, in Dearborn, places like that, and faith-based groups need, need to do their work, but they need to share what they're doing. That's one thing about Detroit, because we've been, excuse my French, because we've been so fucked up for so long, and so segregated, and so poor, we have actually have some of the best NGOs in the world, and they've actually been talking to each other for a long time, including what we do with the hungry, right? So maybe if we can get alternatives for girls in freetheslaves.com, you know, and, and, and different groups that are working on this issue, Peace of Action in Michigan, not only to write grants together, but to pool resources, it would be good. I mean, one place to start would be a full-fledged hospital and facility for them to freaking live. <laughs> That'd be a good thing. The best you get is a halfway house and you're out within 72 hours. That's what we're doing. We're throwing these women right back into the streets. So we need to start talking to our politicians about where our tax dollars are going and what they're going for. And the other outside of the box thing is Seattle, San Francisco, they've done some really good things out west. Maybe we can borrow from some of their templates. I don't have to do a ton of what they're doing, but they're doing a lot of what we're talking about um, in really good, in some really good things. Yes, sir. Well, uh, yeah, I'm by no means professional in this area either. Um, it's been like three years since my college went into college, and we did some looking into the trafficking because I have four daughters, and we were concerned with all the, the kidnappings and trafficking. The numbers three years ago, which I don't know if somebody from the room here includes it, this time, um, the kidnapping of our youth is so high in this country that from what I understand for years ago, the federal government, the plans, the CIA, and the FBI, if concentrated all their fundings, took it away from a lot of local police departments to help with these problems, to concentrate on the human trafficking of kidnapping children that have set out the country through Miami, and then yep. Ohio, just south of Detroit here, and Toledo is one of the main, Absolutely. most populated trafficking sites for shipping children out because they can take children in homes. Yep. It's a little close to Detroit. And I think that that's a major issue. It's, it's, it's worth, if anybody's interested in this, look into this, to see where all this federal money is being spent, because it's being spent on that. And yeah. So, you know, we can get 10, 20%. Yeah, and I think faith-based organizations could do it, it, the same thing. You know, it's harder, the government's so big, especially on the federal level, to tackle that, to bite that up, and to figure out what money's going for what. Um, but churches have really taken the lead locally on this. Um, and I think when you have, you give your donations for a week, the entire ones for a week should go to certain, you know, things, certain groups. The other thing is, is these groups, they work in silos a lot, even in the Detroit area. We're just starting, we're, we're, we just see this as this burgeoning big problem. You hear all the time in the news, well, Detroit's a bad place for this. That's been the case forever. It's actually, I'm from Flint, Michigan. You would see, you would see men, and not, you know, white men, black men, Latino men growing up, 60s and 70s, dating girls 15 and 16, in the hood would be growing up with their parents saying it's okay. I've had them hand me babies in West Africa and beg for me to take them, offer me their daughters at 12 or 13. Even parents saying this. You know what I mean? So there's some cultural things here. And at the bottom of all that is long-term structural poverty. And until we've been there, we don't get it. And you get, you get the empathy because you have four daughters. We all need to think about having four daughters, whether we do or not. But it's a good question. Um, and it's not just money. You can't throw money at the situation. Uh, money doesn't, we know that. It doesn't work with like water and flint, for example, and stuff like that. Um, the good news is, is groups are starting to talk to each other in dialogue. And this issue is at its peak as far as, I mean, look at it. This is, you guys were all on spring break, came back on a Monday. It's nine something at night, and you're here. So that says something to me. And like I say, I don't have all the answers. I would be interested in looking at what you're talking about the financial money and how much of that is tied to kidnapping, how much of it is separate. The other thing is the cartels and illegal wars, especially in Africa. The pipeline of, 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 of folks coming from Central and South America is definitely tied to Mexican cartels. We know that. And they're not taking most of those women from Mexico. They're, they tend to be Mexican people, Mexican drug lords, but they're taking them from Panama, they're taking them from Colombia. Now guess what's happening? Now they're all, within the last three months, we see an uptick in Venezuelan. Why? Because the economy, no one's eating. So it goes hand in hand. Um, we need international ways of dealing with this as well. Um, not to mention terrorism and other things that we need to be on the But I actually see the biggest waste of money with common <coughs> violent extremism and the billions with the way we're dealing with quote unquote jihadi terrorism. I see 
a minuscule amount going for sex trafficking, but the same sorts of mistakes missing. No cultural relativity, no understanding of context and history, no understanding of personhood and identity and how it's constructed, no looking at the demand, you know what I mean? Bust them, throw them in jail, let them out, bust them again, you know? And, it's, and, and, and for all the talk of creative ideas and out of the box that Christiana brings up, and I don't have all of them, I don't see that many, at least coming from here. I see most of the real creative things coming from Western Europe. And by the way, I didn't get into Japan and China, and that's a whole other issue where it's nuanced and happens in different ways, and the way that that's accepted is a, is a whole other thing. Uh, it's 9.30, and we were wondering if you could wrap up with you. Sure. Yeah, my wife's going to kill me. One more, let's take one well, more I question. I just wanted to say, I believe Dina from Alternative for Girls is here. Just oh, so yeah, where are you, Dina? Dina, you know me from, you know Nasman. So he, who, who came and worked with you years ago, I had a, when I was in the Honors College, I had a lot of students who came when you guys first started and worked with you. So I've, I've heard, I don't know if you were there. I've been there 17 years. Oh, you've been there 17 years. But I've had some students who worked with alternatives for girls, and it's been a few years or whatever, but I've heard, are you still in cats? Or? Uh, we never were. Where were you guys? Uh, we've been on Trumbull and we're in West Grand Boulevard. Trumbull and West Grand, okay, I knew you were close. Yeah, come on up and, uh, and talk a little bit about what you do. If you all want to get involved locally, let's hear a little bit about Alternative for Girls. And, and, and thank you for listening uh, to me.